Hi, I'm Lyndon Soles. Have you ever thought about how many times during the day we use drinking water? Well, if you did keep track, you'd find that on average, every day here in BC, we each use enough drinking water to fill three or four bathtubs. In fact, we're among the top consumers of water in North America. Water usage even in the 1920s was excessive and it was double what it was in uh, Seattle and four times what it was in, uh, in, in Winnipeg at that time, which had twice as many people as Vancouver. Yet within the British Columbia context, uh, even though we use excessive water in, in the greater Vancouver region, other parts of the province, notably the Okanagan and especially the, uh, the West Kootenays, use even more water. Olga, what's the biggest source of our water consumption during the summer when we seem to have the most problems? Well, the, the largest water expenditure in the summertime um, is the water use on grass, and mainly grass and gardens. In California, uh, they're trying to wean people off grass, and as you can see, we probably should be doing some of that as well. As you see, almost 80% of our grass here is moss, which actually belongs here. So um, maybe we should incorporate it into our gardens along with ferns and evergreens. Probably the last time you thought about water was the day the sprinkling ban was imposed in the summer of 1992. Since we live in the midst of a rainforest, most of the time we take drinking water for granted. We don't think about where it comes from, how it's treated, or how much it costs. But while there's the perception that we have this abundance of water because of the, you know, it rains all the time, um, the reality is that we're seasonally water short because we have limited storage opportunities. In Greater Vancouver, our water comes from a combination of snowpack and rain that collects in three mountain river and lake systems, Capilano, Seymour, and Coquitlam. But today, we use our water for a lot more than just drinking. We use it daily in our swimming pools, jacuzzis, washing machines, car washes, and even dishwashers. And all of this puts increased pressure on our distribution system. And that per capita demand is increasing in addition to our growing population. And ultimately, our water consumption here in BC is going to hit us where it hurts, in the pocketbook. We use 30% more water per person than we did 20 years ago. That increased consumption, coupled with the anticipated population growth, means each of us must use less in order to conserve our supply and postpone costly system expansions. We are faced with major capital investments to bring online new sources. Alternatively, we can look at, at uh, reducing water use in order to try and stretch the available sources and support more people and, have, and postpone the decision to, uh, to invest in uh, new dams or, or whatever uh, further into the future. Beyond the challenge of getting water to more people, we're faced with the more urgent issue of improving the quality of our drinking water. Opinions voiced at recent focus groups reflect the concerns many of us share on that issue. In the past five years, you know, you open the taps and you smell chlorine. I mean, it really has deteriorated in our area. Uh, my kids won't drink out of the tap. I can't I say as I blame, her, blame them, I end up doing the same thing. I drink the water without a filter, you know. I think it's better than a lot of water that I've had. I don't find the water terrible, but I do either buy water or I, I have the filter. Once my, my bathtub started getting green, regardless of whether it happened at the source or in the pipes in, in my apartment building, um, I was just thought, you know, if, if I'm bathing in this, do I want to drink it? Obviously, you people haven't lived in Saskatchewan to taste the water there. The water here is just marvelous compared to the prairie provinces. The prairie provinces aside, our water is safe to drink, but it doesn't meet the latest federal and provincial government standards, which have become a lot more stringent in recent years. Over the last 10 years, we've seen a real increase in waterborne disease. Uh, 14 different communities have had outbreaks of various kinds of, of disease, and we consider this to be very serious. Even though none of these outbreaks has occurred in Greater Vancouver, the new standards also apply here. We have made a commitment uh, to making sure that the bacteriological concerns that cause waterborne disease are uh, being checked for, monitored, and that when you turn your tap and you get water coming out of your tap, that you know it has been uh, certified as being safe to drink. Other Canadian cities have upgraded their treatment facilities to meet government standards. 
However, Greater Vancouver has yet to implement its improvement plans. The bottom line is, it's going to cost us money to maintain and improve our water. People have always taken pride in Greater Vancouver about the quality of our drinking water, and we've spent a lot of your tax dollars making sure that we maintain that. We know as we go uh, into the years ahead, though, we have more difficult choices to make. Uh, it's your money, it's your tax dollars, and you're going to have to help us make the choices. The first time most of us get concerned about the quality of our water is when the look or taste of it is off. In our house, it's very cloudy, our water right now, and it's disgusting. We need water filters and purifiers to be able to drink what is supposed to be, you know, pure water. That cloudy look is called turbidity, and you see it at times occurring after heavy rainfalls. It most frequently affects the Capilano and Seymour watershed distribution network. The primary causes of turbidity in the watershed have been natural erosion uh, in unstable areas, slides that have occurred, and erosion of channels uh, as the water comes up when, the, when the, uh, the snow melts and rains fall. Some environmentalists believe logging practices in the watershed accelerate the natural erosion. We have observed on a, a number of occasions where uh, logging roads uh, have slumped into stream channels and then received an express ride to the uh, reservoir as a result of the, 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 uh, the swollen creeks that occur. Yeah, this is uh, a typical end result of a, a flash flood that occurred a couple of years ago, uh, whereby some old logging debris that was dropping, um, blocking a gully finally rotted and let go and uh, sent a torrent of, of mud and debris uh, down the, uh, the Capilano River and into the Capilano Reservoir. What do you think of the, uh, the quality of drinking water here on the Lower Mainland? Uh, it could be a little bit better. It's, uh, I find it quite dirty. Uh, I wake up in the morning, find rings around the, uh, around the sinks. Those blue-green rings some of us have seen are not from the chlorine. They're the result of corrosion caused by the naturally acidic nature of our water. It's the same process of oxidization that has caused the copper roof of the Hotel Vancouver to turn green. It's the same thing in the copper pipes that we have in our homes. Uh, with our acidic water running through it, uh, again, the uh, copper being soluble, you get the deposits around the, uh, around the taps. But it's what we don't see or taste in the water that presents the greatest challenges. People complain that our water isn't the same as it was 20 years ago but neither is Vancouver in the greater Vancouver area. It's growing. And the trouble with our water system is it's growing too. So as you have to deliver water further and further out, you have to put in extra safeguards. And that's why the things that we had in place 20 years ago are no longer acceptable in the 1990s. The object for public health is always to deliver safe water at the end of the line. Conservation may help us defer some costly capital expenditures to meet growing demand, but we need to spend some money right now just to maintain and improve the quality of our drinking water. And when we come back, we'll take you below the surface and show you exactly what we need to do. and improve the quality of our drinking water, there are four main areas of concern that we will have to address. Better source disinfection. Better disinfection through the distribution system. Turbidity. And corrosion. I can't say that I'm happy with the way it tastes. Uh, I find, um, I, I find that it's got a real chlorine, chlorinated taste. Greater Vancouver has been chlorinating its water since 1942. The main reason for chlorination is to protect our population against waterborne diseases such as giardiasis, more commonly known as beaver fever. Giardiasis is a problem that is endemic in this province. In other words, there are places in this province where there are giardia. It's a little parasite that gets into your gut and you get violent diarrhea and you get very sick. Greater Vancouver's water system does not have giardia, but watershed experts have observed the cysts that cause giardia within the watershed. There are two primary ways to rid the system of that cyst. One is disinfection with chlorine, and the other is filtration. It's much less expensive to use chlorine as the, as the primary disinfectant than it would be to go with filtration. 
If people continue to use more water, and as more and more people move to this region, we're going to have to lay a lot more of these pipes just to get water to them. But as this distribution system grows, we're going to have to ensure that the people at the end of the pipe get the same safe quality drinking water as people near the source. We put chlorine in its source, and it kills the bacteria that have come out of the reservoir. But as it goes through the lines, there are many places where there can be breaks, there are many places where it can pick up bacteria and can cause problems. To kill any bacteria that subsequently enter the system or grow in the pipes, you need to ensure that there is a chlorine residual at the end of the line. You don't want to put in a whole bunch right at the front so that the people on the North Shore and the people in Coquitlam get, a, get the heavy chlorine taste. You want to put in enough to do the initial work and then simply add it down the line to keep it up. And, and it then makes a more pleasant water system for everybody. The critical choices we will have to make in the very near future boil down to how we approach secondary disinfection. We have two options, rechlorination or chloramination. From a public health standpoint, either is acceptable. They both achieve the same thing. What we're going through is we're looking at the environmental impact of chloramination. If we choose the chlorine option, we will have to pay the high costs of setting up 40 to 60 rechlorination stations throughout the region. Free chlorine is a, is a stronger disinfectant, but it's not as persistent, and it would take a lot more of these rechlorination satellite rechlorination stations in order to carry a residual out into the extremities of the distribution system. Having 60, possibly more, rechlorination stations would require tanker trucks of of uh, bleach basically traveling throughout the area on a very routine basis and of course there's always the potential for an accident to occur there and a subsequent spill. Chloramine, a combination of chlorine and ammonia, is currently used in 25 percent of major North American cities. Victoria has been using it for the past 50 years. Chloramine doesn't break down as quickly as chlorine and so lasts longer in the system reducing the need for additional stations. For example, a plant uh, which I have behind me here is a chloramination plant, and we'll be putting in three of those at the three reservoirs we have in the North Shore watershed. So we're, we're looking at, if we go with chloramination, it's only about a, a one-seventh of the cost of going with chlorine. Also, on most taste tests, chloraminated water scores higher than rechlorinated water. So it's cheaper to use and tastier, but it has its own drawbacks. So you're not exactly hot on the uh, chloramine option. Why not? No, we sure aren't. Uh, chloramine is an absolutely uh, deadly poison to fish. And uh, not only fish, but also insect eggs, um, crayfish, frogs, anything small that lives in the water is highly susceptible to chloramine. Well, how would it get into a stream like this one? Mostly it gets in through water main breaks from the main uh, drinking water system. And when breaks in the water mains occur, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of gallons spilling out of large, uh, large pipes that are under pressure. But that's not the only way it can get in here. Uh, another way is uh, through uh, uncontrolled public use by uh, people washing their cars, watering their lawns and their gardens, and there's millions and millions of gallons used that way in the summer every day. The lower Fraser River estuary is an area that's covered with small productive fish-bearing streams. From what we've seen in, in the small-sized small creeks, certainly the chance of a fish kill is, is quite real. In fact, there have been two fish kills as the result of a pilot program to test the use of chloramine in South Surrey. The first one resulted when a contractor was excavating a, into the ground and he broke a water main. Uh, that was about a kilometer away from the stream, and despite that distance, it killed all the fish from the point of entry to the mouth of the creek. In the second fish kill uh, that we saw, there was a water main, an old concrete asbestos water main, which broke in the early hours of the morning. And in that case, we estimated about 3,000 young salmon were affected. They were killed. Since then, an emergency response system has been put in place to minimize the effects of possible water main breaks. Essentially, it really does boil down to there isn't anything to pick from a health standpoint between the chlorination or the chloramination. It will probably come down not to the health issue, but to the environmental issue and the cost issue. Chloramination will cost above $100 million. 
That would add an additional $25 a year to our household water rate for a yearly total of about $150 per household. Rechlorination will cost about $150 million, or about $165 per household per year. We take the city water and run it through a set of multimedia filters that remove any uh, particulate matter from the water. Many industries rely on a steady supply of water. Some have to process it more than others. For example, this brewery uses 15 bottles of water for every bottle of beer it produces. At this point in time, really our only uh, concern is uh, the occasional uh, problems with turbidity that happen in the winter. Uh, we find that um, the, the silt that comes through with the water is so fine that our regular filtration system won't remove it. We then have to resort to very uh, extra, very expensive and very fine uh, filters to get the very clear water that we require. Filtration facilities of the source would help lower the turbidity levels, but filtration costs between $150 and $350 million. A cheaper solution, and the one being worked on now, is the westerly transfer, which would access water from the Coquitlam Reservoir, which doesn't have the same turbidity problems. This, the westerly transfer will, will uh, fulfill three basic functions. One, is it'll now enable water to be moved west from the Coquitlam source into the Capilano Seymour service area. It'll enable either Capilano or Seymour to be taken out of service for whatever reason, if repairs have to be made. And the, the third uh, function of the, uh, the westerly transfer provides increased security of supply. One of the major problems with corrosion is the damage our naturally acidic water is doing to our plumbing systems. In the greater Vancouver region, it costs homeowners and businesses about $10 million a year to replace worn-out plumbing. It particularly affects high-rises which recirculate hot water. We have to get the uh, acidic level of the water down. We'll be adding some uh, natural ingredients at the reservoirs to bring that uh, acid level down uh, to stop the corrosion in our pipe system. Throughout North America, consumer concerns about the quality of drinking water have created a demand that marketers have tapped into. Today, bottled water and home filtration units are a multi-million dollar business. Filtration systems work and are fine, with the one catch. They're expensive to start with, and they must be maintained. A lot of people don't maintain even the simple fil filters they put on their systems, and they could set up a system in their house that will actually trap bacteria and cause them problems that they didn't have. Health and Welfare Canada also keeps an eye on the bottled water that is sold off the shelf. Studies in Ontario showed that some of that bottled water off the shelf was far less safe than the water coming out of the tap. That's not been the case with our own studies here, where the bottled water sold here has met all the standards. Sometimes we don't realize just how great a bargain our natural drinking water is. Let's do some comparison shopping. Here's what a loony will buy. A can of pop, a half liter of bottled drinking water, a liter of milk, two liters of gasoline, or 10,000 liters of mountain fresh water from the GVRD system, about the same amount that fills the shallow end of this swimming pool. Next, the costs of maintaining and improving our drinking water. Excellent, safe drinking water at the present time. What we want to do because of our population growth, because of the expansion of our water system, is making sure that that good, safe water that we've had for years and years here in the GVWD continues for our children in the future. There are several choices before us on how we can improve the quality of our drinking water. The choices won't be easy because they each carry their own environmental, financial, or health consequences. So, in phase one, we can opt for chloramination or rechlorination. Chloramination would cost us about $100 million and bring us within 80 to 90% compliance with government standards. In phase one, if we were to choose rechlorination, that would cost us about $150 million and bring us to about 70 to 80% compliance. Right now, the board's committed to go to the phase one, $150 million, and then we'll review whether or not after we finish this program, whether in fact we have to go to phase two or not. Phase two, which would involve building a filtration plant near the Seymour Reservoir, would cost an additional $150 million and would bring us within 95% of the government standards. Phase three calls for a filtration plant to be built near the Capilano Reservoir and would add another $200 million to the costs. 
but would give us almost 100% compliance. But just how far do we want to go? To achieve that last uh, one or two percent uh, would cost us, uh, uh, as I said, millions of dollars, which I don't think the taxpayers particularly will want to uh, spend. You start adding these components together, I think it would be totally irresponsible for people like uh, Mayor Campbell, head of the GVRD, to try and slap an additional $250 to the residents of the GVRD. I think that for many people, cost is the bottom line for a lot of things. But I still think that the bottom line should be health and environmental concerns. Right now, we are getting a bargain of the 100 bucks a year, a real bargain. Mm -hmm. Agree with him. Because we have no limitation, I think we're doing fine. We know we have good, safe drinking water in Greater Vancouver. We know people have taken a great deal in pride in the quality of the water they have here. But we also know we're facing some tough choices. We know that we have to choose between spending $100 million and $480 million. And we're saying to people, what would you choose? There's economic issues, there are environmental issues, there are public health issues. We want people to tell us how they'd balance those things out. In this series, we've been examining the demands our growing population is placing on many things we've taken for granted in this region. Water consumption is one of them. Conservation will help minimize the demands on our system. What can we be doing in our kitchens to conserve the amount of water we use? Okay, one of the things that I've done is I've installed a, what is called a water saver. It uh, has an aerator in it, and it also has a sprinkler flow control. And that, according to the manufacturers, reduces the water use by 25%. So um, that's a savings just in the kitchen. And I guess the same principle could apply with the shower? And this, uh, the shower head has a similar device inside which is reduces the volume of water, a water saver it's called. There are a number of other things we can do on the home front to save water. Everything from watering our lawns and gardens less to not letting the tap run when washing the dishes or brushing your teeth. The days of, uh, of, of cheap water are, uh, are over and from now on every, every uh, source that you bring online is going to become increasingly more expensive. In the coming years, we're going to be asked to make a lot of critical choices about our future. Here on the West Coast, we've come to realize that it's going to take a lot more effort just to maintain the quality of life as we know it. Water is one of the basic essentials of life. And even if it costs us more in the coming years, to ensure that our children have a safe and steady supply of that essential, isn't it worth it? Add your voice to a series of public consultations by calling this number, 1-800-222-2222.